Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you are. Um, a little bit dark where I am today, so short straw has finally fallen towards me. JC is finally in the daylight. This is the first time we see you in the daylight. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Yeah, good to be good to be at a decent time today. <laughs> Amazing. And Jason is just locked in his office, so we don't even know if it's daytime or night. There's no windows. It's irrelevant. So, There's no windows. <laughs> there you go. So welcome to Disasters Deconstructed live stream. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is the second part of the special series of live streams that are related to Power, Prestige and Forgotten Values Manifesto, the Disaster Studies Manifesto. Um, in the first part, um, if for those of you who haven't seen it, we had it in June. Uh, and it is available on YouTube. So in the first part, we spoke to uh, Sarah Beaven, Laurie Peake, Mihir Pat, Terry Gibson, and Jilali Benoit. Um, and we were discussing the opportunities and challenges in post-disaster uh, research. And we also hope that this conversation will soon be published uh, in Disaster Prevention Management Journal. And indeed, this live stream is collaboration with DPM. Uh, and so, yay, thanks, JC, for arranging this and making it possible. It's great. So today we have some absolutely amazing guests for you, um, all of whom are early career researchers who really inspire us. And also, if I may add, um, all women. So yay, finally, finally, we have a whole female panel. Uh, so joining us today are Shifal Lakina, Kyra Zoe Canete, Maria Rodriguez Alarcon, um, and Nenya Campbell, uh, from whom you will hear shortly, of course. And again, as you've probably figured out already, JC is joining us again as a co-host, which is great. Um, and we will also be hearing from Loi Clodeau today, who is helping us with uh, interpretation from Spanish, because Maria will be uh, presenting and um, doing her intervention in Spanish. Uh, as always, if you have any questions to ask, please um, put them on the social media. We will be monitoring Twitter, Facebook, and all, all of that. And Jason um, will be posting your questions uh, to the speaker. Um, and we will definitely have time for discussion. So please uh, enjoy this live stream. Yeah, it's exciting. Um, so great to be able to do a series of live streams promoting um, a lot of the things that we've been having conversations about, a lot of kind of unpacking these issues. Um, and hopefully many of you watching this will be familiar with the Power Prestige and Forgotten Values Manifesto. The link is right there on the bottom of the screen. And um, this came about because many of us who are working in disaster scholarship felt that the way we do research needs to be challenged. And that unfortunately most of the work within uh, being done in the Global South is grounded in an uneven distribution of power. Um, and so there's been a lot of work behind the scenes bringing us to the point of um, publishing this manifesto and all of the other work that is ongoing um, kind of springing out of that. Um, and, but there are some amazing practices that, that researchers are undertaking. And in the first part of this series a few months ago, and as Cassandra said, please catch up on the recording of that on, on YouTube. Um, Laurie, Sarah, Jalali, Mahir, and Terry all focused on the importance of ethics, cooperation, collaboration, respect, and trust. Um, but sometimes it's easier for us um, as established scholars in secure positions to talk about these things. And we can, we can sometimes kind of disregard the realities of um, neoliberal institutions that impact on early career researchers. Um, and maybe disrupt the, that, that conversation or prevent that conversation. Mm -hmm. So JC, maybe you want to say, say a few words um, to, uh, to that, just to introduce the importance of talking to early career researchers. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, uh, Xenia, for having me again. Uh, I feel empowered now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah. No. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Jason, for um, reiterating the importance of the manifesto. And I'm I'm very very much looking forward to this event today because one of the major um, sources of inspiration for the manifesto in the first place was the increasing discomfort we were 
feeling and encountering when talking to early career researchers, especially PhD students and and and, and postdocs and students where you're not yet uh, in a position of power in, in the academia. And, and this is how I think many of us uh, sort of mid-age established researchers came to realize that, um, or at least it was my own personal uh, feeling, we sort of messed things up in the sense that I, I deeply believe that, at least myself, I'm speaking on my own behalf here, but we haven't lived up to uh, the expectations of our mentors. There's people who in the 1970s pioneered and put forward all the ideas behind the so-called vulnerability paradigm. And I, I, I strongly believe in that I, I've completely failed to actually uh, match their expectations. And, and this was one of the, of the reasons why we came up with the manifesto. We didn't want the young generation, the, 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 the early care researchers who felt uncomfortable with this kind of tension we introduced in our own scholarship over the past 20 years. We didn't want them to kind of carry on and do the same things that we've been doing since, I would say, since the 1990s. And that was the whole driver behind behind the manifesto. And so I'm very much looking forward to to listening to, um, to all of our guests today because they are these people who have inspired us and who are going to carry the field forward in the years to come. And um, Jason mentioned that there are a few things um, ongoing behind the scene. I don't want to jump again here, but um, watch out for the for the upcoming, the next uh, episode of um, these live stream events. I know Xenia, you're gonna talk about it afterwards, but there will be a couple of things that we are follow up on the manifesto and, and and moving beyond uh, beyond the manifesto, so watch out for this. And um, good as well because I mean we just uh, reached a landmark as well, a milestone for uh, for the manifesto. We initially set the the, the 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 cap for the number of signatures to 500. It was a kind of yeah, uh, not random order, but it was just kind of we set 500. Could have been 400 or 600. Um, we reached the 500 recently, we're at 506 just now. Um, so we had to increase the cap. So I think this is a sign that uh, we are getting traction with this initiative and we didn't expect to get there. I mean, the cap was rather an upper limit we, we set for the for the signatures. And um, I mean, I'm so happy to see that there's a, there's a momentum behind that. There, there's, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's some energy taking the, the field forward. And the energy comes from these individuals who will be uh, listening to today. So I'm very much looking forward to this. And um, yeah, back to you, uh, Jason and Xenia. Super. Thank you so much for this introduction. And well, as always, for highlighting everything that's important and kind of why we're doing this. And indeed, if you haven't signed the manifesto yet, um, check it out and do sign, you know, if you agree with the principles that, that we are promoting. So anyway, without any further ado, I think you've heard enough from all of us. Let's move on to our speakers. Um, and our first guest today is Dr. Shifali Lakina. Um, Shefali is co-founder of Wonder Labs, um, a social enterprise catalyzing innovations with communities on the front line of climate impact. Since 2005, Shefali has contributed to a range of innovations in disaster risk reduction policy programs and research. Um, she caused the UN's first global assessment report on disaster risk reduction, um, led the design and delivery of an award-winning city-to-city sharing initiative uh, for the cities of Quito, Kathmandu, and Makati, and Shifali recently co-founded the Reimagining 2025 Living with Fire Design Challenge uh, to center the voices of students and early career researchers in community wildfire risk reduction efforts. Shifali, we're really excited and delighted to welcome you to the live stream today. Over to you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to jump right in because we have 10 minutes and so much to share. <laughs> so I'm going to structure my 10 minutes by quickly running through three key challenges and three corresponding opportunities that I see in disaster research right now. 
The first challenge really centers around how we understand disasters in time. And so we already begin to unsettle the term post-disaster research here, right? Are disasters to be understood as disruptive events, um, historical process, uh, perhaps politicized imaginaries? And I don't mean this to be a trick question. The thing is, there are no wrong answers. Earlier this week, Jason and Kasania, you hosted a very timely discussion on this podcast around the framing of disasters as event or process. And it truly was fascinating to hear all these different perspectives. Um, and I agree with your conclusion that disasters can be framed as both event and process, depending on context. But I don't think we fully resolved the broader question because framing disaster as an event or a process still speaks to dominant disciplinary and programmatic ways of seeing. Emergency managers tend to focus on the event because they're concerned with preparing for and managing disruption. Planners tend to focus on the process because they work to reveal the root causes of disasters and influence policy to prevent disasters, mitigate disaster risk, etc. And yes, there's increasingly overlaps between the two perspectives. But for a moment, I want us to think about whose voices have been missing from this fairly technocratic discussion so far. And I really hope the answer going through all your minds is it's the voices of people, communities who are living through disasters each year. Right? Communities in the front line are likely to tell us very different things about how they experience disasters in time. We know from our qualitative research that disaster impacts can be experienced as forever unfolding across years, decades, even centuries. And so it's important we also learn from vernacular and diverse ways of seeing, experiencing, and narrativizing disasters. One of my um, favorite examples of this kind of vernacular imaginary is the Chitrakar scroll or living commentary provided by the Chitrakar artists of West Bengal in India. Um, you can find it on YouTube uh, or online. There's narratives on the Indian Ocean tsunami, 9-11, COVID-19, if you'd like to check them out on YouTube. And it's interesting because these paintings are narrated in song format presenting nested cycles that fold human time into divine time or big time. This format allows diverse perspectives to co-narrate the universal and yet deeply contextual experiences, including the social and political causes and impacts of disasters. And the unifying theme in such cosmologies is that they don't limit themselves to depicting one-off events but they constantly situate and contextualize and cross-reference the experiences that connect us across time, places, and identities. Our second challenge in disaster studies, I feel, has to do with unsettling conceptions of place and how we understand disaster-affected communities to be situated and constituted in particular kinds of locals. Generally, we understand these locals to be rural landscapes in developing countries and in the global south. Now, what we've seen in the global um, COVID-19 pandemic, a society's general affluence is no protection from extreme social vulnerability and spiraling disaster impacts, right? Affluent places are experiencing increasing levels of inequality, relative deprivation, which are both caused by and can result in the systemic marginalization of particular demographics. Where I currently live in California, it's the very unequal impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, the devastating wildfires, smoke um, impacts, fueled by housing instability. So our second challenge in disaster research is really um, to free ourselves of this notion that only places and communities in the developing world somehow constitute disaster affected locals. That's simply not true anymore, especially going forward. The third challenge is about expanding our notions of who does disaster research 
And this relates to a long overdue intersectional analysis of disaster researchers identities. We need to recognize that we are a diverse set of people with complex layered identities who travel and live across countries and can variously self identify as being local migrant or external, depending on context. So it's important to ask who is local to where. And it's also important to ask how non disaster researchers are preparing to conduct disaster research in the current landscape. COVID-19 has triggered cascading effects, bringing so many non-disaster researchers from adjacent fields, suddenly front and center into disaster research. So a meaningful intersectional analysis of who does disaster research can complicate that simple binary of local and external, and ultimately who does disaster research. Looking into the future, I suggest disaster researchers and funders of disaster research, which you know, I'm currently doing through Wonder Labs, begin to lean into um, three existing opportunities. Um, the first is a commitment to convergence research, where researchers can reach out and across their silos. They act as bridges um, between worlds and communities. As part of our work at Wonder Labs, for example, um, this is something we require from teams entering our Reimagining 2025 Living with Fire Design Challenge program. We ask teams to be interdisciplinary, represent at least two distinct disciplines, and partner with at least one community partner. The community partner directly receives part of the funding from Wonder Labs, so we can support deeply contextual and yet convergent um, conceptualizations of what constitutes disaster research and who benefits from it. The second opportunity is in funding more longitudinal research that allows researchers and communities to form lasting bonds across one, two, five, even 10 years of research. And this doesn't have to come after a disaster. Longitudinal research that engages with people's whole lived experience, not just post disaster recovery and reconstruction, can enable us to commit to taking the time and care to engage with communities on an ongoing basis. So we need a lot more of that. Equally, researchers need to learn how to hear no from communities. If grassroots organizations don't have the bandwidth to work with you, take no for an answer. Leave them with something useful to remember you by and perhaps re-engage at a later stage if it's still mutually possible to do so. Finally, who are the disaster affected populations that we're all looking to serve? We are, right? There's no community on the planet right now that is not living with some kind of ongoing disaster impact defined in the broadest sense of the term. If anything, the past years have shown us that disaster researchers are increasingly from disaster affected communities. So we need to begin to learn more and more from researchers who are already steeped in their communities, working on mitigating climate impacts, acting as bridges, translators, reimaginers of desired and possible futures. My hope is that disaster researchers can find support, care, and develop trust in relationships with their co-researchers, institutions, and communities, no matter where they live and work in these precarious times. I'm going to stop there, and I look forward to hearing from the others. Thank you, Shefali. Thank you for this um, inspiring words and, and words of wisdom from, from the field. And I have to say that I had the privilege to uh, examine your PhD thesis. It was really a privilege. It was not a, um, a chore um, in the sense that you were one of the first people who meaningfully engaged with the manifesto and not as something that you took for granted, but you criticized it. And it was, it was a really useful kind of experience reading your critique and your perspective on, on the call. Um, and that, that has definitely inspired us to, to, to move forward. So thank you for that. Um, so next we have uh, Maria Rodriguez. And um, I, I'm super happy to have Maria here because we, we 
share a common mentor who is uh, Virginia Garcia Acosta in, in Mexico uh, at CSS. And this is where we met for the first time with Maria. And uh, Maria now is at the Colegio de Michoacán um, in Mexico still. Um, and um, doing some research on um, disasters in uh, Mexico. But Maria is from Venezuela originally. Um, so um, we are very much looking forward to, to your perspective, Maria. And we know how uh, all of us in this field are, um, are owe so much to Latin America and um, the amazing ideas that have come up through uh, La Red over the past uh, 30 years. And next year is going to be the, the 30 year anniversary of La Red as well. So watch out for some. Uh, I think special event from Xenia and Jason for them. Um, so we are very much looking forward to listening what the new generation of Latin American uh, researchers uh, can bring to this field. And I'm, I'm sure it's going to be as insightful as the previous generation was. So Maria, we are very much looking forward to, to learning from you and, and from your experience in doing research in, in Mexico. Um, over to you and like for translation. Thank you, JC. Thanks, Senia, Jason. It is a real honor to participate in this live stream. Uh, before I begin, I'm also grateful for the presence of some of my ethnographic informants. Um, I'm going to speak in Spanish in order to have a better interaction with them. Loi, thanks for uh, this translation, translating this. So, well, Uh, actualmente eh, me encuentro realizando una investigación en torno al desastre que se produjo tras un sismo de magnitud 7.1 el 19 de septiembre de 2017 en el territorio mexicano con afectaciones en siete entidades diferentes. Eh, tras cuatro años del movimiento telúrico, aún quedan muchas interrogantes con relación al proceso de recuperación de la población afectada, particularmente aquellas personas que habitaban localidades fuera de la capital del país. Esta investigación, de la mano de otros trabajos que he desarrollado previamente, me han ayudado a dar respuesta al objetivo central de la actividad que nos convoca el día de hoy, orientada a discutir precisamente las oportunidades y desafíos que nos plantean los estudios sobre y en contextos post-desastres. Desde hace más de medio siglo se ha venido incrementando el interés por el estudio social de los desastres vinculado a las transformaciones que se han estado produciendo en las dinámicas socioeconómicas a nivel mundial. Sin embargo, transcurridos más de 30 años desde la adopción del diseño internacional para la reducción de los desastres naturales, no ha habido una reducción significativa del riesgo a desastres. Las pérdidas económicas se incrementan en un promedio entre 250 mil y 300 mil millones de dólares estadounidenses al año. Asimismo, en los países de ingresos medios y bajos se está produciendo una creciente mortalidad que puede expresarse en unos 42 millones de años de vida humana que se pierden anualmente en contextos de desastres. No obstante, uno de los grandes desafíos para reflexionar críticamente en torno a los desastres implica precisamente trascender los análisis constreñidos únicamente al número de fallecidos y a la cantidad de recursos económicos invertidos en los procesos de reconstrucción posteriores al evento coyuntural. Los estudios centrados en el costo-beneficio han demostrado sus limitaciones, pues se orientan básicamente a determinar la cantidad de dinero gastada en la reposición de edificios o infraestructuras dañados. En este sentido, es imperativo colocar de, re de relieve la necesidad de adoptar medidas para abordar los factores subyacentes del riesgo y, por ende, las condiciones de vulnerabilidad. Asimismo, quisiera llamar la atención acerca del carácter profundamente antropocéntrico que ha caracterizado las reflexiones de los científicos sociales en torno a las coyunturas desastrosas. En gran medida, las propuestas emanadas de estos estudios entienden las catástrofes básicamente desde dos dimensiones los límites naturales rebasados por la expansión humana y la discusión antropocentrismo-ecocentrismo. No obstante, se ha dejado de lado la construcción de una teoría significativa que advierta la dependencia de los seres humanos hacia el medio ambiente desde una perspectiva dialéctica e histórica. 
Igualmente, es necesario apuntar hacia un enfoque crítico a través del cual documentar y estudiar la expoliación capitalista y sus consecuencias ecológicas concretas. Las decisiones orientadas a generar crecimiento económico conllevan procesos que tienen resultados ecológicos potencialmente desastrosos, donde además una gran parte de la población se vuelve más vulnerable debido a relaciones económicas desiguales. Otra dimensión que me parece importante problematizar es como cada vez más los contextos post-desastre se han convertido en una oportunidad para la materialización de agendas políticas y económicas particulares. Allí el neoliberalismo trabaja para el reordenamiento de las relaciones entre el gobierno y el capital privado, a partir de un corporativismo donde aquel canaliza fondos de recursos públicos hacia el sector privado a cambio de la prestación de servicios, por ejemplo, las gestiones de reconstrucción, Además, ellos se sustentan en un marco ideológico modernista donde los tecnócratas conciben transformaciones específicas del entorno construido, entre ellas la homogenización del territorio y las viviendas e incorporación de elementos estéticos como vías para transformar un espacio social considerado pobre o tradicional. Es necesario advertir y analizar la articulación de actores públicos y privados que atienden a un urbanismo proempresarial pues las coyunturas, eh, las coyunturas desastrosas se convierten en oportunidades para generar dinámicas excluyentes de reconstrucción y construcción, pues algunos quedan relegados a una situación de vulnerabilidad en tanto tienen menor poder económico y político y en generar poco poder de negocio. Desde esta lógica, además se descartan los valores y sentires de quienes experimentan directamente el desastre, al ser considerados obstáculos para la aplicación de las mejores prácticas racionales en la prevención y recuperación de desastres. Esto según la perspectiva de desarrollistas y planificadores. Eh, de allí que las experiencias, conocimientos y emociones de la población afectada son interpretados como trabas para el análisis costo-beneficio o para la gestión tecnocientífica del desastre. Pero a la par, los expertos y las élites promueven el deseo de ciertos entornos y relaciones humano-materiales tendientes a reproducir el capital. En este sentido, otro desafío que se presenta en los estudios de contextos post-desastre es el despliegue de reflexiones críticas que permitan comprender de qué manera los efectos negativos de una catástrofe se ven profundizados debido a las inequidades expresadas en ciertos procesos de recuperación y a las brechas que existen entre lo que es el conocimiento, la toma de decisiones y las prácticas orientadas a atender estas problemáticas. Estos argumentos además nos in permitan introducir una tercera dimensión dentro del proceso de recuperación post-desastre que me parece importante destacar y es la denominada ayuda o asistencia humanitaria. Esta se encuentra enraizada en marcos ideológicos emanados de lo que es la caridad y la filantropía que se expresan en el acto de salvar y proteger la vida. Actualmente el humanitarismo además es advertido como un movimiento y un esfuerzo compasivo para brindar asistencia y protección a las poblaciones del ries en riesgo. No obstante, también es un negocio, y esto hay que reconocerlo, donde se compite finalmente por la participación en el mercado. Hemos advertido que el número de organizaciones gubernamentales y no gubernamentales que se ocupan de los desastres se han incrementado en todas partes. Podemos hablar de una especie de economía o industria de los desastres que se encuentran entre las de mayor crecimiento en el mundo. Aun cuando el resultado de la asistencia humanitaria sea positivo, eh, se concreta de acuerdo con los términos y las relaciones de poder emanado de las instancias que prestan la ayuda. Además, el carácter excepcional que se presenta tras un desastre da lugar a una tensión entre lo que es compasión y orden, justificando intervenciones bajo un criterio moral de lo considerado humanitario y desde la simpatía que provocan los siniestrados. Allí las necesidades de la población afectada pasan a ser una preocupación humanitaria, mientras que la quimera de la igualdad frente a una coyuntura que supuestamente afecta a todas las esferas de la sociedad se convierte en el motor de la acción colectiva. Esto también me lleva a referir un elemento adicional que considero que debería transversalizar nuestras investigaciones y que lo entiendo como un desafío, pero también como una oportunidad. La recuperación post-desastre debe entenderse no solo desde lo que es la, vert la verticalidad de las decisiones y acciones de las diversas instancias involucradas, se debe dar mayor visibilización a los procesos que al interior de los grupos afectados surgen en respuesta a las consecuencias adversas del desastre. En muchos casos se generan iniciativas, se evalúan necesidades, se producen movilizaciones colectivas para enfrentar las problemáticas sin esperar apoyos externos. Igualmente, es imperativo comprender los procesos de redefinición y reorganización de esas prácticas locales, es decir, analizar también esas formas de apropiarse de las lógicas neoliberales para el propio beneficio de los grupos locales y sus comunidades frente a las coyunturas desastrosas. 
Sin embargo, y en esto quiero colocar el acento, a atender estos aspectos no, no diluye la importancia de visibilizar las causas subyacentes del desastre. El desarrollo de prácticas comunitarias para sobrevivir debe reconocerse, pero sin perder de vista que estas no resuelven las raíces de los problemas sociales que finalmente exponen a ciertas personas a sufrir daños y que además les plantean enormes desafíos para recuperarse tras el impacto de un desastre. Enfocarse únicamente en las capacidades comunitarias como solución para mitigar o reducir los riesgos en realidad no incide en las causas de fondo del problema. Allí se desplaza el foco de atención a dimensiones, eh, se desplaza, perdón, del foco de atención dimensiones claves vinculadas a la vulnerabilidad, como son la pobreza y la desigualdad. Bueno, well, eh, this is all. I could add additional elements to the discussion, but to respect time limit, I leave here. Thanks a lot. Amazing. Thank you so much, Maria. That was a fantastic intervention. And we look forward to asking you lots of questions. I'm sure there will be loads. So thank you once again for your time. Um, and thank, thank you, you. Loic, very much for translating the intervention for us. Uh, Loic will be joining us for Q&A okay. to support Maria. Thank you. Um, thank you, Loic. <laughs> If you have any questions for our um, guest today, please um, post them on social media and we will bring them up. Or in fact, if you have uh, comments also, please send them uh, to us and we will post them on the screen. Um, our next guest is Dr. Kyra Zoya Albur Um Kyra is a Filipino feminist scholar with training in anthropology and critical development studies. Um, and she specializes in gender, disasters and development. Um, Kyra's PhD research, which she did at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, um, grounded in feminist epistemology, political ecology and ethics of care, um, and critically examined building back better, my favorite phrase, phrase uh, disaster reconstruction in uh, Tacloban City in the Philippines, following Typhoon um, Haiyan or Yolanda, as it's also known, from the standpoint of women. Um, Kyra served as the founding executive director of A2D Project, research group for alternatives to development, um, a research to practice and duo in the Philippines, focusing on just the risk reduction, humanitarian assistance, and inclusive sustainable development. I am so excited to have you here today on our live stream and to talk to you because um, I first learned about you through your paper on Photoquento, published in Disasters a couple of years ago. I loved it so much i absolutely screamed you know read it so thank you so much for um writing it and thank you for joining us today so over to you kyra thank you so much senya for that uh, uh generous introduction um and for having me here and for giving me the opportunity to talk about my work um although i retain affiliation with uh NGO and the uh, University of the Philippines. I'm currently based in Australia at the moment where I'm teaching um, international development at the University of New South Wales because I unfortunately could not return home the last couple of years because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as customary here in Australia, I begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where I am located today. Uh, I currently, I'm currently on the land of the Bedigal people of the Yora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. I also pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait uh, Islanders um, who are with us today. So broadly speaking, and as uh, been uh, discussed in the introduction, my work over the last 10 years centers on uh, the intersection of gender, disasters, and development. I, I didn't start out as a disaster studies scholar, but I, I work with grassroots women's organizations, um, NGOs, uh, and basically my influences are in feminist theory and critical development studies. So my PhD research uh, looked at disaster reconstruction after Typhoon uh, Haiyan in Tacloban City, which was um, the heaviest uh, affected when uh, Typhoon Haiyan uh, hit the Philippines in 2013. And I looked at uh, women's narratives of recovery as a way for us to understand institutional processes of reconstruction. So for this live stream, um, we've been asked to reflect on our perspectives on opportunities and challenges for post-disaster research. And there are many things I could probably talk about 
in this reflection, for example, how can early career researchers, particularly from the global south, like myself, contribute to conversations uh, in disaster studies, or how we can link um, issues of um, or how we can link disaster research to broader frameworks of justice and equity, which uh, the first two speakers have been talking about and uh, something that I'm also working on with a number of colleagues at the moment. But for this talk, um, I would like to focus on an issue which has figured centrally in my PhD research. That is, how do we conduct post-disaster research? And I approach this question by drawing on my political and ethical orientations and positionality as a feminist scholar and development practitioner who has spent over 10 years working in this field in the Philippines. So when I was conceptualizing my doctoral research, I continually asked myself, how can I use the tools of decolonial and feminist theory and methodologies to inform my research design, um, because basically these were frameworks that were very influential in shaping my own perspectives. So these concerns stemmed from an acknowledgement that while there is a wide range of qualitative and quantitative tools that have been utilized to study disasters or post-disaster contexts, there remain little critical examination on the research methods themselves. And while I strived as much as I can to adhere to research practices grounded on participatory frameworks, there were always, or there were also times when I unfortunately participated and even reproduced what I call extractive um, research, where participants are regarded mainly as sources of information rather than being themselves producers of knowledge. And these practices and my role in them have been a great source of discomfort for me. So they say that the PhD is the best time to explore new ways of thinking and doing things because it gives you the gift of time to incubate and test out ideas. And I was certainly privileged to have been able to step back and think through my experiences and reflect on alternative ways to conduct post-disaster research. So these reflections would eventually lead to the development of photo cuento, which uh, Xenia had uh, mentioned earlier. So cuento is a Filipino term, which means story. So photo cuento would translate to telling stories with photographs. And so this is a feminist photo-based method, which I designed to co-construct narratives of disaster recovery, along with study participants. Having been immersed in development practice over the years, I had observed two problems or challenges. Uh, we can, we can uh, consider it as one of the challenges in disaster studies, um, particularly relating to methodology. So first is the very real issue of power imbalances intrinsic in researcher researched relationships, particularly in contexts where these inequalities are more pronounced and prone to abuse such as disaster context or conflict. All too often, I found that the voices of marginalized groups are rarely heard in making decisions that ironically affect them the most. Second, I also problematize the kind of instruments or mediums of inquiry that are often applied in disaster contexts. Um, I was trying to explore what tools might be useful to capture the complexity of human experiences of a disaster beyond word-based and habitually highly technical instruments that we commonly employ, um, what techniques might be able to generate more effectively narratives and stories, as well as the embodied experiences and emotions, um, which are actually so central to disaster experiences, but are routinely overlooked. And certainly there has been a lot of evidence that point towards the potential of photo-based methods to facilitate more engaged and meaningful research relationships. So this was the starting point of uh, for working on my methodology. So while I do not have time to go over my methodology at length, um, because it is a very long process, um, photo cuento involves the use of participant-generated photographs in conducting interviews and co-constructing narratives of disaster recovery. So this entailed uh, three processes, image generation, development of the tool, and the interviews themselves. And I worked with a group of women who took photographs of their everyday lives after the typhoon and collaboratively put 
collaboratively put together a photo album, which became the tool to interview other women in selected study sites. So in this way, this becomes a mean for women to rethread um, their experiences by engaging with each other's stories. And I have to say that carrying out a photo cuento was one of the most anxiety laden, but also the most fulfilling part of my PhD journey. Anxiety laden because it is always painful to divest control of the research process, especially when we are trained in a particular way as researchers to privilege our own authorial voices over that of the voices of our participants. It was fulfilling because in the end, the results were very rich and study participants started to see themselves as an important part of the research process. So to wrap up my short contribution, I would like to say that often um, disasters are viewed to represent powerful moments wherein what is considered, considered the normal order of things becomes exposed. In, uh, in the words of Stephen Lux, disasters can lift veils. The period of disaster recovery in particular, when people are confronted with the need to reassess what has been lost and disrupted, what needs to be reconstituted and what needs to change, offers a precious opportunity to put our theories and approaches to the test. What we see when the veils are lifted, however, is or can be tricky because there is no single way of seeing or interpreting that which disaster exposes. And this is where the importance of methodology and epistemology comes in. If we are not conscious of shifting methodological and epistemological orientations, then we also, as disaster researchers, no matter how committed we are to the work that we do, we may also run the risk of reproducing structures of inequalities which shape to a great extent people's vulnerabilities to disasters. Um, I still have a lot of discomforts about how I conduct research, and I try as much as I can to be reflexive in my own work. And there are certainly many things which I think I could have done better or done differently. But I regard this challenge also as an opportunity to continuously find alternative ways of doing post-disaster research. So for those who are interested in, in the full process of Photo Cuento. It is uh, published in Disasters um, Journal. And also, you can also get in touch with me uh, to discuss this further. So thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much, Kara. That was incredible. And um, I have so much I want to talk to you about. Um, and we need to um, we need to have you back as a guest again on the podcast, I believe, because you're really getting at some of the things that are um, important to us that we've been trying to to unpack. Um, and I hope the audience, <laughs> thanks. And I hope the audience will um, continue to send us your questions for Kyra and the other guests. Um, we have one more intervention before we're going to open for questions. But thank you for so much for that. Okay, so our final guest tonight, um, I'm so pleased to um, welcome Dr. Nanya Campbell to the um, live stream. Dr. Campbell is Deputy Director of the Bill Anderson Fund, BAF, and a research associate at the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado, Boulder. Her work with the BAF supports leadership and professional development training among historically underrepresented minorities pursuing doctoral degrees in fields related to hazards and disaster research. And her projects with the Natural Hazard Center translate empirical research into tools and information products designed for practitioners and decision makers, such as guidance for responding to disasters during, during the COVID-19 pandemic and key principles for risk communication involving marginalized communities. And um, I, I've noticed that a lot of your work in the past couple of years, Nanya, has been um, really at this interface of um, marginalized and oppressed groups and practitioners and researchers. So I'm really excited um, to hear what you have to say about this kind of um, research in a post-disaster context when there's so much going on and there's, there's um, all these power imbalances at play. Over to you. Thanks for being with us. 
Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity and have been really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so yes, a lot of my work is on that intersection with practitioners and disaster, and disaster research and also around programming. So I'm bringing a little bit of a different lens to this work, um, but I think I think it's important for us to, to think about that next level too, about the people who are ostensibly, we hope, using our research. Um, and that's always been something that's really of interest to me. So that's kind of the lens that I'm applying here. Um, so I'll just jump right into it with some of the challenges that I see with thinking about how to do this research, especially in the post-disaster disaster environment, one thing that comes to mind is how we produce reciprocity in our re research relationships. It's something I've grappled with a lot, just how to acknowledge and compensate fo folks for the time who are sharing their data and their knowledge with me. Um, and I think that this can be challenging to figure out what constitutes appropriate compensation for our, our participants' time and their energy. And of course, that's not something, a, a matter that should be simply up to the researcher to decide uh, for, for those who, with whom we collaborate in the field, but we all operate under different cons different constraints and especially for those of us who are back to this theme of us being early career scholars so with regard to budgets or policies or other factors um, that's something I've grappled with a lot with where I am in my career and how much command I have over over my resources and projects um, but I've, I've drawn a lot of inspiration from my colleagues I have a colleague uh, Dr. Hans Louis Charles who's discussed really thoughtfully in his work pointing out some of the issues around reciprocity and research the need for dialogue with our local collaborators um, the fact that we have to be engaged in this creativity and, and relationship building with them, and also noting that compensation isn't necessarily uh, something that's around that has to be monetary, but that it can reflect the value of our findings, our data, the things that we're producing from the time that people spend with us. And so that's something that's one challenge that I've really grappled with in my work. Um, and another one, especially as someone who is more of an applied researcher, is how do I how do I make my research more useful and used? Uh, and that's already uh, there's been a lot of discussion around uh, the importance of publishing with our local our local researchers and knowledge producers and the folks we're working with in the field but that's in my from my position that's raised the question about you know what about when we're working with community groups or doing that kind of applied work how do we co-develop products uh, with them that are useful to them and that matter in ways that an academic publication simply doesn't. And so I bring a little bit of that perspective to this, um, and that's something I'm particularly sensitive to. And, and I, I do think that it's important, of course, for academics to, to contribute to the broader discourse, to share our findings. So I'm not saying that that's not valuable, but the people that I'm working with often aren't reading academic journals. They do want access to information. That's something I've received very little training for in my academic career, and yet something I've bumped up against time and time again. And I've had enough experiences now with you know, people prototyping things and having the folks that I'm working with say, what am I supposed to do with this to now get the importance of co-design, of actually understanding what people need from the data that uh, we're generating together. So I've, I've worked that more and more to my approach, but that's an area where I'm still learning. Um, the final challenge I wanna discuss uh, is this, the recent burst of interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion. There are um, a lot of conversations globally too that this plugs into with relate to, in relation to human rights and inequality and democracy. But again, as most of my work uh, has focused on the US, that DEI construction and how it plays out uh, is the, the context that I'm, I'm really thinking of here. And so I, I think that this, this also serves as an opportunity, right, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment. But I, so, but I do wanna be clear that I'm not characterizing the interest in these issues as the problem per se, but I do think it's important to be critical about how that interest manifests itself. And so th this focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion is now working its way into funding calls and project requirements. And so I'm, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of this. And I think many times that's done in ways that are still reproducing a status quo that is unequal and extractive and ethically problematic. But the language of social justice is being used, and one could say co-opted, often with genuine interest and care behind it, though not always. Um, but more, more commonly, I do think that the language and concepts of social justice are becoming these buzzwords for well-intentioned people who nonetheless may be ignorant about the social and systemic dynamics that reinforce the inequality that they're trying to address. And that raises questions for me about what damage can be done when organizations say that they're doing equity work in the disaster zone, but doing it 
uncritically through unjust and inequitable systems. And I don't claim to be an expert on in, in every case on how this should be done, but I recognize that we need to be cautious about the perverse incentives for superficial acknowledgement of these issues. And I think that there's a lot of opportunities now for to, to plug in quote unquote diverse populations into projects and initiatives that perhaps uh, with perhaps with the promise of funds, especially in the post-disaster environment, but not necessarily with the intention of actually enabling their input or expressions of agency. So it's something I've been trying to be mindful of in my own work, and particularly as I transition into the leadership of an organization that's focused on diversifying the disaster uh, the disaster workforce and uh, supporting cohorts of emerging scholars who want we want to be equipped to challenge the status quo and to bring a, a more equitable uh, approach to this work. And in terms of opportunities on the flip side of that, I also want to acknowledge that this explosion of interest in diversity, equity, and inclusion has opened many doors to really valuable conversations about the work we do in disaster affected communities, about who's included in our research teams and what it means to include people. What does equity actually look like on the ground and in practice? And I've seen the needle really move on these conversations in the course of my academic and professional development. Uh, and I think it's served as a useful foot in the door to question and and push conversations to that next level. So I do see that that concept, that DEI concept as a bridge to the momentum that we've been building uh, with more, uh, more scholars critiquing issues like social vulnerability, exploring ethical standards and power differentials in the field. And these are things that aren't that weren't being as widely discussed and the way that they are when I first became involved in disaster studies. So I think it's really, uh, that's really exciting. And um, particularly in, in the context of this global interconnected community that's linking folks who have concerns about issues of environmental justice, about fundamental human rights across geographies and hazards and timelines. So I don't want to be entirely uh, cynical in saying that the the issues of diversity and equity and inclusion and fairness are to be dismissed, but I, I th it's because I think there's a lot of value in this interest and the conversations that they open the door to, um, particularly because I've seen the impact that it's had on the composition of our workforce, which is the second opportunity that I see. Um, diversification of the disaster research workforce is something I've been focused on for a good chunk of my professional career now. And I'm incredibly encouraged by the shift that I've seen because when I first entered the field, black people and people of color more broadly were few and far between. And that's actually one of the things that connected me to Bill Anderson before his passing. And so for folks who don't, who aren't familiar with the with Bill Anderson and his work, Bill was a black sociologist who cared deeply about pushing this field to, to better serve oppressed people. And he felt that an important step toward making that transformation was bringing more people from marginalized backgrounds into professions related to disaster research and hazard mitigation. I didn't know Bill for very long before his untimely passing away, but when his wife, Norma Anderson, announced a few months afterward that she was picking up where Bill had left off to bring his vision of a more diverse disaster workforce into fruition, I wanted to be on the ground level of that. Um, and I understand that uh, achieving more just outcomes in disaster research or within disaster affected communities isn't as simple as add people of color and stir, right? Um, it's, it's not just gonna, it's not gonna make a difference to add new faces to reinforce the same policies and reproduce the same problems, but that's also not what I'm seeing. Um, I'm so impressed by the folks who have come into this field, even after me, even though I'm still you know, early in my career, uh, but the, the, the students who've come in after me are so critical and thoughtful and creative and much at a much earlier stage in their career. And so that's something that I think can, is really exciting and I'm really excited to see where their voices will take the field. And finally, um, the third opportunity that I see that I'm really excited about in my work is collaborative research networks that extend beyond research um, and beyond this and more towards that concept of convergence that we often talk about. So there's a lot of good that can come out of research networks, for example, the societal, uh, the social science extreme event network at the University of Colorado and this, the structural extreme events uh, reconnaissance network, for example, those kinds of 
research networks that link researchers, I think, can really push forward some important conversations about things like uh, ethics and the training needs of our community. Um, but one of the concepts that I've found really promising are different kinds of networks where they're less research focused, maybe more problem focused. So, for example, um, one of the, the groups that I've been sitting in with and listening to for the past few months is the Disaster Justice Network, which is a network of uh, that was formed last year in, uh, in response to the hurricanes that struck Louisiana. And that includes faith leaders and, and researchers and advocates and practitioners and other folks who have this expertise in disasters. Um, and, and we're working towards finding addressing issues of inequitable access to disaster uh, response and recovery efforts. And that initial focus on recovery, um, you know, speaking to the issue that Shafali raised about disasters as a process has evolved over time as the area has gone through several major disasters in that time. And so just watching, listening to those conversations and being in the room for those virtually, um, I've been really impressed and encouraged by the ways that those that they've activated that network to do things like deliver tangible supports like supplies and uh, home repairs, but also working with folks in the policy space to kind of start to address some of these root cause issues. So I've been thinking, uh, taking a lot of inspiration from that and, and learning as a researcher, as I continue to grow, what it can look like to be plugged into a network with those kinds of diverse relationships and not focusing specifically on research, but what we do with it, because ultimately that's why we get into the field. Um, but I know I'm probably right at time or maybe a little bit over it. So I'll, I'll stop there. Wow, thank you so much. That's that's powerful stuff, Nanya. And um, I really look forward to um, just opening this discussion up to others. Um, I love what you're saying about, you know, bringing diversity into the workforce is much more than just um, people that look different in the workforce. It's about thinking differently. It's about that those critical perspectives that are are coming in because of the diverse workforce. Um, so yeah, I just love it. And um, at this point, I'm gonna bring everybody back in and we have some questions prepared. We're open to more questions from the audience. Um, thank you all. This, is, this has just been um, an incredible session so far and we have, we have a way to go. We've been, um, challenge to talk about uh, or to think more deeply about several prominent kind of deep issues um, about our own positionality in research, about um, diversity in our workforces, but also in the way that we the way that we think, um, the voices of people, how, how they're represented, how they represent themselves and um, to to look look at how we represent others as well um power imbalances in research extractivism reciprocity i can't say this word reciprocity <laughs> i always have trouble reading when we do a live stream um mm -hmm. but but all of these things are just so so important and you've you your um, interventions have just been really powerful and I think, Ksenia, you're going to start us off with the first question, save me from um, digging myself from deeper. Reading. <laughs> <laughs> save me from reading. Uh, that is the cry for help I've been waiting for. Um, thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience, uh, and we'll start with those. Um, and after that, we as co hosts uh, can monopolize the floor because we have lots of questions. Uh, but let's start with the audience. So um, the first question we have is for Maria. And hi, Loic. Thanks again for joining us today and for translating. Um, so the question is uh, from Carly. And Carly is um, asking, I'm interested to hear more from Maria. Um, what are some examples of how problematic power dynamics with organizations hinder recovery processes locally? Thank you. Thank you, Senia. Eh, bueno, voy a hablar en español y lo me va traduciendo. Okay. <laughs> Intentaré decirlo lentamente. Eh, bueno, el, los ejemplos que tengo más frescos eh, son justo de la investigación que estoy realizando ahorita eh, y que precisamente yeah, the, the examples I have to share with you are, are very much related to the research I'm, I'm, I'm doing at the moment. 
Eh, que por cierto, el domingo estamos por cumplir el cuarto aniversario de que ocurrió el sismo en México. Yeah, this Sunday we are about to, um, to celebrate uh, 25 years uh, anniversary of um, the event that happened in, in Mexico. Bueno, y este, en este caso me gustaría comentar eh, una organiza, un proceso organizativo eh, que es la Red Nacional de Damnificados. And I would like to share about um, la red. Eh, es una red que se conformó eh, por damnificados que estaban demandando el derecho a una vivienda digna en las diversas entidades del país afectadas por el sismo. Uh, and it's, it's an organization that was, um, can you repeat, Maria, please, just the end? <laughs> eh, por este, conformada por damnificados de diversas partes del país afectadas por el sismo. Uh, that has been involved in different parts of the country that um, parts that were affected by the, um, the earthquake. Y gracias a este proceso organizativo eh, se ha logrado establecer enlaces con el gobierno federal. And thanks to that process that was uh, organized with the um, federal government. Eh, para que se reconozca eh, la corrupción que se dio en lo que fue la adjudicación de los recursos para atender este problema. And that uh, help recognize um, um, all the issues. Corruption. All the work. Oh, is it? Is it? Okay, I was not sure. <laughs> uh, the corruption that was linked to um, to 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 that uh, event and the and the recovery. Eh, igualmente en la capital del país, eh, muy reconocido el caso de no sé si podrás traducir esto Tlalpan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, bueno, este, de otro proceso en la capital del país. Uh, so th there was um, there was a process uh, next to the, the country capital, is it? Yes. But uh, I can't translate the name. I'm sorry. Tlalpan, <laughs> el multifamiliar yeah. de Tlalpan, eh, y fue un caso también exitoso. Eh, de reconstrucción gracias al proceso organizativo de los damnificados. It was a, a successful recovery process um, thanks to, uh, to this collaboration. Eh, pero como eh, lo hacía explícito en mi intervención, like I was saying in my, um, my talk, el hecho de que se visibilicen estos procesos organizativos no quiere decir que se hayan resuelto este, las causas estructurales de de la vulnerabilidad y el riesgo asociado a los desastres. Can you repeat that, Maria? Sorry. <laughs> no, este, eh, que el hecho de que se visibilicen estos procesos no quiere decir que realmente haya habido una transformación de las causas estructurales de los desastres, a menos en el caso de México. Uh, so it doesn't mean necessarily that um, there's been a transformation, there's been, there's been, um, a transformation happening um, after the recovery that it, it translated into civilization. What did you say? Sorry. Um, uh, the the root causes of disasters. Oh, <laughs> thanks for helping. <laughs> Thank you, Loic. Thank you. Thank you so much for this. Um, Great, and now we have even more questions. So, uh, th thanks a lot, Maria. Um, we now have a question for Nenya. Um, if Jason could bring everybody uh, onto the screen, hey, Nenya. Uh, so, I have a question um, for you um, about the concept of co design, which uh, with research participants, which is really quite exciting. So. Are there different examples that you've seen that have been really successful or fruitful? Yes, so there are a couple. Uh, the first one I'll discuss is really recent work that I've done, and it's not it's not research so much as uh, designing information products for practitioners, but I'll have a, another research uh, project that I can discuss afterwards. But one thing I'm really excited about is the guidance we've recently developed at the Natural Hazards Center on risk communication involving marginalized communities addressing issues of social vulnerability. Uh, so we've built out this suite of projects, uh, products over the past few years, starting with just an annotated bibliography, you know, what do we know about risk communication best practices, and then a, a guide 
that about how what does this look like in practice? How do we apply these core principles that we've synthesized from this literature um, and, and translate that into what, what it means on the ground to, to do this work? Um, and so that started off with you know me designing this this guidebook and kind of and presenting it to all these these people in flood flood risk management with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and and having them give me some feedback about you know this works this doesn't we want more examples and really getting a better understanding of how they might use this product and so that helped to shape the guide that we created. And then in the past year, we've developed that guide out into a extensive um, set of booklet of worksheets. So it takes step by step through the process. What, what do we talk about? What do we mean when we're talking about social vulnerability? What does that mean for when you're doing community outreach about, again, returning to those ideas of reciprocity? How are you actively listening? And what are you offering to communities? You're not just telling them, you know, here's some flyers on your flood risk, go hand them out. But how do you actually develop those relationships and learn how to frame your outreach in ways that are resonating with the community's priorities and needs? So I've been really proud of that work and really interested in it. And that 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 set of worksheets was uh, created by me talking with folks doing this, uh, those those activities in different places throughout the country. Um, for example, I had a lot of inspiration for um, someone in Alaska who was doing outreach involving a lot of remote communities. And so one of the things that they found to do uh, to get community input was hosting their meetings on the radio so that they could call, have people call in from remote locations who couldn't stream it. Uh, and so there's the kinds of things I was thinking about and gathering that input and then it, building this product iteratively with those folks. Um, another example is some work that I did, uh, which I was ostensibly an evaluator on this project, but it was involving a group of students. It was called the Minority Surge Capacity and Disasters Project. Um, and that was done in collaboration with the University of uh, uh, Nebraska at Omaha uh, and Lincoln and the University of Colorado Boulder. And that uh, was a student training program similar to the Bill Anderson Fund, uh, but our, their research component for our students was to go to the US Virgin Islands this was after the 2017 hurricane season. Um, and the first set of students went, we, we did a lot of time working with local researchers and listening to the community, visiting with the long-term recovery committee there and listening to what some of the issues were locally. Um, a colleague and I, after that, uh, helped with developing a grant proposal for the issues that I identified that wasn't really on our radar, but was on theirs about food security. And so we helped them write a grant to, to develop, develop this food security project that when we came back the following summer, uh, one of the teams of students was working on that building community gardens, a, a, a demonstration garden for, for this broader effort that they had funded from that. Uh, and so I think, you know, not just coming into a place with our lens about what the problems are, but really listening to what the priorities are in the community and then doing the work to think about how that links back to the disaster issues that we're talking about is really important. And I, I just really appreciated that process of having that relationship and we're, we're still, I'm still continuing to collaborate with folks on that. Uh, one of my, my colleagues from that project on, on different issues moving forward about long-term recovery. Um, and so I just really valued having the, my, my research collaborators um, and the practice collaborators, the folks who were, not in, who were not researchers, but brought that different lens and have helped us understand the issues at a level that we haven't and develop new questions from that moving forward. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nene. JC, you I think you had a question I'm, for everybody, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, no, th thank you, everyone, for such a, an insightful conversation. And I think these are the kind of uh, discussions we need in the field, talking about epistemologies and methodologies and relationships and and, and inclusion, equity, and, and all these um, very uh, real issues on the ground. Now, I just would like to step one um, um, or, or further back somehow and try to think in terms of ontology and what we actually mean by disaster, because there may be some sort of elephant in the room here uh, that we all know what the object of our search, what the disaster is in the first place. And I think this is this is something I would like to hear from you in terms of uh, not only how you define the disaster for yourself, but uh, how you discuss and bring that up with your participants and whether there's actually such a thing as a disaster in the first place. I'm arguing in an upcoming book in the coming weeks that the concept and the whole discourse and there's maybe an invention of the West and there's no such thing as a disaster as we usually mean it. 
So I mean, I, I would be very keen to engage in a, in a conversation in that in that space. If any of you wants to uh, chip in and, and, and comment. Sorry, and I didn't any, want to share the moment. Yeah, in, 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 in any order, um, please just start um, start responding. I can jump in. Um, JC, I agree. I think disasters, um, it's, it's relative, the experience of a disaster what we call a disaster, right? But I'm not so sure it's a Western invention. I mean, if you go back uh, to any of the ancient scriptures from any of our civilizations, um, you know, we talk about um, stuff that happens, let's just say, and we can call it a disaster. If it's flooding, if it's fires, if it's earthquakes, right? And the stuff that happens that creates um, the kind of ruptures um, and the kind of um, dissonance in society, I think universally is understood as disaster. Um, but it is relative in terms of how we politicize that imaginary um, and how we situate it. Like I gave the example of the Chitrakar uh, scroll, which I wanna go back to because I just find it so poetic, you know, that kind of nesting of this is an event which has to be found within a larger time scale, which is way beyond our lifetime, let's say, you know? And to be able to constantly situate ourselves in that and learn from um, the kinds of social, political, historical processes that are at work, and then, you know, comment on them, raise awareness around them, um, is I think the, the task that a lot of the vernacular kind of imaginaries give themselves and that we can learn from. Um, and it's always going to be kind of political, uh, you know, in terms of what we call a disaster. I think that's, a, that's an eternal challenge that we have um, set for ourselves conceptually, um, you know. Yeah, I'll stop there. Anyone else? Yeah, I think um, Shafali has uh, brought forward really um, import important um, points. Uh, and I'd like to add uh, the, the notion of whose disaster is it and, and how disaster becomes assigned uh, particular meanings. And there are domin certainly dominant discourses about what disaster is. It's a disruption. It's an event, you know, and issues of capacity and vulnerability. But when we talk about... Um, lived experiences of disasters, it's also important to fold in people's everyday experiences of disaster as they also unfold through time. And this is what uh, I really um, appreciated about Shefali's um, presentation uh, earlier, because we tend to think of disasters as um, sort of occurring in, in a vacuum, not just in terms of time, but also the social processes and, histor and historicity of disasters as well. Um, in, in my own field work uh, in, in Tacloban City, well, certainly Yolanda, you know, it's, it's really a, a very powerful event that, you know, really reshaped uh, the lives of people and even the entire city, the whole landscape of the city. But then when you go deeper, there are really narratives about uh, placemaking, what it means to be uh, living in an area which is considered at risk. And therefore, for the decades that you've been living there, suddenly you are an at-risk population and you need to be moved and uprooted from the ways of life that you know. And I think there's an important conversation that really needs to be um, put on center stage uh, regarding the the centrality of, of um, life ways, which uh, you know, do not necessarily resonate with the very technical um, constructions of how risk and resilience and risk reduction and recovery are being constructed in uh, mainstream discourses. Um, I mean, these, these are all. Uh... Nina, go ahead. Go ahead. I really just want to echo, echo all of all of the what's been said. Um, I think that all really resonates with me and makes me think and reflect on a lot of my experiences in the field. I, I just I just want to express appreciation there. I didn't want to cut you off. 
But I, I think, I mean, you all made very valid points in, in response to the question. Uh, and of course, when I, when I suggest that disaster may be an invention of the West, it's not dismissing uh, the material reality of the occurrence of natural phenomena, of people suffering on the ground. It's just the way the concept has been pitched and how the concept supports a particular discourse, which is very much grounded in a view of uh, the interactions between nature and society, basically. It's positioning disaster at the interface and how this has supported this very dominant and um, I would say universal and hegemonic view of what a disaster is that has been imposed everywhere. And I mean, if we re return to the Philippines, Kyra, I mean, in, I mean, in, in, in many languages in the Philippines, we don't have a word for disaster. I mean, we use calamidad, which is Spanish. We use sahuna, which is Sanskrit. Uh, I mean, in our language, in, in Pampanga, we have, a, we have many words to try to capture somehow what we mean in the West by disaster, but there's no exactly the same thing because the concept doesn't exist as such. And I mean, you can talk from your perspective, Kara, possibly in your own language, but this, this, is a, this is very difficult to actually translate the disaster in many other languages beyond the Zachi or Latin etymology. What I'm thinking, JC, maybe what is Western is like the claim to ownership of the of the definition of the meaning, um, or claim to having the correct meaning. That's very Western, right? Um, um, go ahead, Ksenia. I wanted, you know, since since we are kind of talking about concepts and meanings, I actually um, I wanted to go to Maria um, and just to to kind of to unpack and pick up on certain point that you've made in your intervention. Um, so, Maria, in your intervention, you've pointed out so precisely that um, disasters provoke sympathy, right, in, in, in quotation marks. Um, and of course, we, we understand, I think, all, all on, in this room, um, that this is further exacerbated by the language of vulnerability, right? That another big concept, very Western concept. And so through that concept, we immediately label people as weak. And that is convenient, right? Because we can hide behind sympathy instead of offering solidarity. So do you think it's possible to make people realize that sympathy doesn't address the root causes of disasters, but solidarity will? Oh, it's a complicated question. <laughs> Um, Lloyd, go for you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, realmente creo que ahí, eh, retomando un poco lo que, lo que comentaba eh, JC. Um, thinking about what I was saying before in my, in my talk and um, JC, I'm not sure what is JC. Oh. JC. <laughs> oh, JC, sorry. JC. <laughs> Creo que, que es un tema bastante complicado eh, teniendo en cuenta lo que es este también, esta hegemonía se da en términos ideológicos, ¿no? It's, it's very complicated, especially because those um, uh, terminologies reflect ideology. En términos hegemónicos también. And uh, in terms of uh, hegemonic, in hegemonic thinking. Eh, y los propios, este, las propias poblaciones afectadas eh, retoman estos discursos. The people who are affected uh, use the discourse. También como una estrategia para acceder a esta ayuda. Also as a strategy to access uh, resources and, and help. Eh, entonces, pues ahí tendríamos que, que advertir eh, de qué manera. So we will, ha we will have to um, find, find a way or which way. Eh, las personas también este, se apropian de estas este, ideologías y estas praxis neoliberal para acceder a ciertas ayudas. 
um, find find ways and understand how people um, um, use those terms, use this discourse to to access those uh, those external help and resources. Y por otro lado, de qué manera también este está bajo esta lógica de la ayuda humanitaria. Uh, and on the other side as well, um, under that, that umbrella of uh, humanitarian support or humanitarian aid. Se producen intervenciones en los territorios. Uh, there are interventions in the different territories. Eh, bajo esta lógica de modernizar y de erradicar la pobreza y lo considerado tradicional. And there's a logic of uh, modernization and, um, and I, I, what was your last sentence, uh, last words? Uh, the poverty and the traditional ways. Poverty and traditional ways. Yes, something like that. <laughs> traditional way of living, yeah. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. JC, I think you, you wanted to um, make a little comment, right? And then Jason. Okay. Yeah, no, your, your point, Maria, about um, peer forming vulnerability, peer forming in, in Judith mm -hmm. Butler's sense, uh, I think is, I mean, is, is, is important because vulnerability is a resource. Being vulnerable is a resource to steer attention and, 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 and bring resources in. And there's a fantastic paper on the topic by um, an Australian researcher, Sophie Weber, an early career researcher as well, Sophie Weber on, on peer formative vulnerability in Kiribati, which is exactly spot on. You may know her career. I think she's based in Melbourne now. Um, but this is exactly what you were what you were discussing, how the discourse is um, used and uh, reinterpreted to actually serve a particular purpose. Which may not really reflect the local reality, but there's a there's a point for doing this. Sorry, yes, uh, also um, I'm sorry. Also, uh, Roberto Barrios talk about humanitarian reasons to to talk yeah. about these issues. So I think it's important to and Didier Fassan also talk about this. Yeah, I wanted to just follow that a little bit more. Uh, with a question to Nenya, um, a few a few of you, have, and maybe everybody has kind of got at this in different ways, um, that there is a kind of well-intentioned humanitarian um, call that, that occurs and maybe an impulse that occurs within people. Um, but like we like to talk about Freire a lot in, uh, in the podcast, and he, he looks at or he compares humanitarianism to humanism and in in kind of words that we understand you know solidarity to charity and so i wanted to ask you nanya how do you think and you got you got it that's in what you were saying about working with oppressed groups how do you think that we can promote solidarity rather than charity yeah that's a good one um i think that first having being more involved in um, I, over the long term, first of all, <laughs> I think having finding a way to engage with these groups and understand where they're coming from and having that deep connection to the the underlying factors that are are producing the outcomes that they're experiencing and continuing to work with them to address those from a multi pronged approach. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, not just asking for money for the food bank, for example, but also working with uh, these like the networks I was talking about to address the policy issues, highlighting the complexity of the challenges that community face communities face and using our voice to kind of amplify some of those so that, um, you know, we can we can continue to serve as um, those points of connection or, you know, not the not that we're the locus of that, um, but that we're using our networks and our voices to to help um, bring together some of those some of those connections for people who otherwise I think are just engaged on a very superficial, um, you know, here's what you can give. Uh, rather than here's how you can get involved kind of uh, perspective, if that makes sense. It does, thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm mindful of time. Um, again, I 
cannot thank you enough. We kind of thank you enough for all your time and insights. And it's been absolutely wonderful. And Jason, I really hope kind of cheekily that you will come onto the podcast with us. So we will be in touch uh, because we would really like to speak with every one of you individually and just to talk more about things that we've talked about today. Um, I also want to thank you because you've just been so inspirational today. And you really give me hope um, that perhaps one day we won't need disaster studies, we won't need these live streams and podcasts because there won't be disasters, because researchers like you um, will reduce disaster risks in, in a meaningful, um, honorable and reciprocal way. So thank you for inspiring us all and for sharing um, everything that you've shared with us today. Uh, and to the audience, um, thank you so much for joining us today, for you know perhaps missing uh, your amazing, exciting Zoom meetings or staying up. Uh, and yeah, it's always great to have your support. Please join our upcoming live streams um, over the next couple of months. So JC has already hinted uh, a little bit in the beginning that we have um, a very special live stream on the 13th of October. And 13th of October, as everybody knows, is the International Day of Disaster Risk Reduction. Uh, so please watch this space. It will be at noon, um, British summertime. Uh, but we, of course, will provide more details about it. And um, in that live stream, we will be marking the 20 years of RADIX, um, Radical Disasters, um, Disaster Studies Network. Uh, so it will be fantastic. Um, and then later in November, um, we are having our next book group discussion. And this time, the book has been chosen by our comrade and co-host, uh, Darren Alexander-Williams. Um, and we will be reading Development, Drowned and Reborn by Clyde Wood. So again, if you want to join the book discussion, please let us know. It will be great to have you all. Um, Follow us on Twitter and on any podcast apps. Uh, follow us on social media. And of course, enjoy the rest of season five. We still have a couple of very exciting episodes to come before we take a break. And then in January, there will be season six. Um, have a good day and good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.